Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, January 31st, 2022, we are excited to present Arbitration and the Supremes, a roundup of recent and anticipated Supreme Court arbitration precedents. My name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are joined by Manny Farak, Joshua Simmons, and our moderator, Harut Samra, from our International and National Security Law Practice Group Executive Committee. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle questions as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, thank you all for being with us. Harut, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jack. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. As Jack mentioned, the title of today's program is Arbitration and the Supremes, a roundup of recent and anticipated Supreme Court arbitration precedents. Arbitration, as many of you know already, over the last two decades has been a frequent topic of Supreme Court cases. Uh, in many cases, in many terms, there have been more than one Supreme Court case, and the last term was no exception, with the court having decided five cases related to both domestic and international arbitration. The current term has one case currently before the court, which will discuss all of these over the course of the next hour, while also maybe looking ahead, time permitting, at some of the new precedents that we think may be the subject of further uh, Supreme Court precedent in the near term, uh, and frankly, precedents that will likely change the landscape of both the domestic and international arbitration practices. It is a pleasure to host uh, today's program, particularly in light of, I think, our two panelists who are extremely experienced both in domestic and international arbitration and who will speak to those areas respectively. Uh, first, we have Manny Farage, who is a shareholder with the law firm Mrachek, Fitzgerald, Konopka, Thomas, and Weiss in Florida. Uh, Manny is a three-time certified lawyer in the areas of real estate law, business litigation, and appellate law. He's an extremely experienced arbitrator as well and advocate and has served as an arbitrator under the AAA for more than 30 years, since 1990. Josh Simmons uh, is a partner at the firm Wiley Ryan in Washington. He's a uh, extremely experienced practitioner in high stakes international disputes, concentrating on international commercial and treaty cases. He formerly served as a senior advisor in the office of the legal advisor at the Department of State and is on the faculty of the University of Virginia School of Law, where he teaches international arbitration. Thank you again to both of you so as we begin today's discussion, let's begin by focusing on the 2021-2022 term of the court, uh, during which, as I mentioned, the court decided some five cases on international and, and, and domestic arbitration. Uh, one of those, and I, I'll turn to Manny first, was the firm uh, was the case Bajarau and Walters. Uh, Manny, if you can tell us a little bit about that case. Absolutely. Um, and, and by the way, Root and all attendees, um, if you're... Uh, I mean, looking through these cases, I'm reminded of uh, Justice Kagan's, uh, then nominee Kagan's famous statement, we're all textualists textualist now. Uh, three of these cases that I'm going to cover are great textualist case. The fourth, uh, I'm not so quite sure. But let's start with uh, Badgero versus Walters. What Badgero does, um, it uh, makes it easier um uh, to, uh, excuse me, um, Badgero restricts federal jurisdiction to hear petitions, petitions to confirm arbitration awards. And I, I'm being very careful with that language because there is a difference here between confirming awards and jurisdiction in the first place. What the court did in Badgero, it narrowed the authority of federal courts to hear the petitions to either confirm or vacate arbitration awards under Section 9 or Section 10 of the FAA. What's the end result of this thing? Uh, there's, there's going to be more actions to confirm awards or vacate awards in state court. That the, the way the court approached Badgero, it said that federal courts only have jurisdiction to hear post arbitration motions are to confirm or vacate an arbitration award when federal jurisdiction itself, either diversity or federal question, is presented by the petition to confirm or vacate. Federal jurisdiction cannot be based 
on the underlying dispute that was arbitrated. For those of you who are familiar with this particular area, this is the, the famous look through jurisdiction that the courts have taken a look at and, and have uh, used in the past to determine whether or not an action was proper under the FAA. So what's going to end up happening now uh, in, in with regard to FAA actions, there's going to be jurisdiction to confirm or, or vacate in federal courts only when there's complete diversity or when the petition claims a federal law, uh, other than the FAA itself, of course, requires uh, confirmation or vacater of the award. Just the fact that there, there was underlying federal questions in the arbitration itself does not matter. Again, the look through jurisdiction under section four of the FAA is no longer the basis for uh, actions to confirm or vacate. So that uh, that sort of wraps it up there. That's a, a quick summary, um, a route. And, of, and many, I think it's worth uh, first inviting any of our attendees. If you have any questions, you can submit them through the Q&A function and we'll be monitoring them and asking uh, questions along the way uh, any questions that are more sort of generic, we will hold uh, for the end as well. But one question, Manny, and you referenced this on this point of, of jurisdiction, uh, where the FAA is not an independent basis for federal jurisdiction. Uh, you may want to elaborate on that a little bit. So I think that our audience has some more context. Sure. D different different question. The, the FAA, all it does is enforce um, arbitration. It does not give jurisdiction itself to a claim brought in arbitration. Now for look through jurisdiction, um, the FAA is going to allow you at the early parts of the arbitration process itself to look through to see if it's going to be something that is going to be covered by the FAA. But to confirm or to vacate the award itself, chances are unless you have diversity or a federal question itself in the arbitration process, you're going to be going to state courts. So you're mm -hmm. you're actually limiting uh, the scope of the FAA in this particular sense. So in effect, if, for example, you had a federal question in the substantive phase of the arbitration, uh, but you do not have diversity in the enforcement stage, you may end up out of federal court at that stage. You're, you're, you're in state court. Um, and you know, obviously, every state is a little different. Uh, but historically, um, federal courts are more more welcoming, I guess, is the best way to describe it, of arbitration actions than some state courts are. So that may create some issues for some folks. Okay, we have two questions on this, Manny. I'll turn them to you quickly. Uh, number one, uh, from Robert Fitzpatrick, both of them. Uh, in light of Badgero, how should companies draft venue provisions, presumably also arbitration agreements, to get section 9, 10, and 11 under the Federal Arbitration Act enforcement or vacator petitions? into a favorable forum, uh, meaning presumably uh, among the various circuits. And then the second question, what impact could Bajero have on arbitration or subpoenas under the FAA? I, I don't see much of an impact on arbitration subpoenas, taking the second question first. Um, I'm not, I'm running through this, Robert, I'm thinking in my mind, The, the citizenship of the parties to the, um, to the uh, arbitration itself is not going to be dependent, unless I'm missing your question, Robert, it's not going to be dependent on the venue. Um, so I, I don't know if that's going to be very helpful. Obviously it's a federal, it's a Supreme Court case. So it's gonna apply across all, all the circuits, all 13. So um, I don't see it maybe, Maybe you can drop me a, a line privately, Robert, and I can try to explore this a little bit more. But I don't see how you're going to really sort of limit Badger Row by, by virtue of venue clauses mm -hmm. in your arbitration awards. Uh, Haru, uh, am I missing something there? One last question on this. Richard Faulkner asks, do you predict that the Badger Row decision will open the door to the expansion of vacator petitions in often hostile state courts? Wow, great question. That is a strategic move I hadn't considered, but you're probably right. Um, yeah, that, that may do it. That may do it. Um, and 
that would be a strategic question. Maybe that was what Robert was thinking of. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good question, quite a good question. And perhaps a good and, and, and you began with that premise, right? That this is probably going to end up with more acti putting more activity in the state courts than than in the federal courts. Maybe it's how much is hard to tell, I suspect, right? Right. At, at this particular point, you just don't really know. Um, and, and if you can find some way, if you want to stay in the state, in the federal courts, um, try to find some basis for federal question jurisdiction to confirm. I mean, that's going to be probably the, the easiest way to do that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Manny. Let's turn to the second case. And now having begun with this question of jurisdiction uh, under the Federal Arbitration Act and what standards the courts apply, let's turn to the question of compelling arbitration where a party has taken some steps in the courts uh, and, and maybe as a result has waived their right to arbitration. That is really the subject of the Morgan versus Sundance case, if you'd like to walk us through what the court did in that case. Absolutely. The question here, and this is an opinion written by Justice Kagan, uh, going back to the question of we're all textualists now. Um, and, and a bit of background um, uh, with regard to this particular issue. Some courts had said that uh, when you make a determination, when a court makes a determination whether or not a party has waived its right to arbitration, you have to look at two things. The actions of the party um, that um, supposedly waived um, arbitration. Uh, did they litigate extensively? Did they do a lot of discovery? Did they uh, reaffirm the right to litigate as opposed to arbitrate? A whole bunch of factors there. And the second thing that you looked at was whether uh, the other party, the non-litigating um, party or the non the party that wants arbitration, whether they were prejudiced uh, in any way, manner, shape, or form. So it, it really was a, a two-step analysis uh, when you were trying to determine whether or not the party waived its right to, to seek arbitration. In Morgan, um, it was a unanimous decision, and the, uh, the majority opinion, the, the opinion was authored by Justice Kagan. She said that um, that's all fine and good, um, but the FAA has nothing to say about uh, whether a party has been prejudiced or not. And if you look at this from a contractual analysis perspective, um, you look to see what the party did itself. That's it. You don't look to this prejudice question. Uh, you don't examine anything outside of the FAA. And you just, just take a look at the party that actually supposedly waived arbitration. This, this, reversed an Eighth Circuit precedent that um, that really more focused on the prejudice uh, of a particular party. And um, it, it really just set forward, stepped forth the, the, the idea that, hey, uh, look to see what actions they took in order to, to waive arbitration and nothing else. Pretty straightforward decision and non-controversial, obviously, if it was unanimous. So on some level, will this make the analysis more objective, really just looking at what steps the parties have taken in the arbitration to determine whether or not they've waived the right to arbitration? I, I think so. And um, look, the, the question of prejudice was always a um, subjective one. Um, you know, what is prejudice? Um, statutorily, it's not defined, of course, in the FAA. And different courts are coming down and on, on different points as to what constitutes prejudice. And that, that created some uncertainty uh, with, regard to, um, with regard to whether or not a party had, had waived um, the right to arbitrate. Uh, with this bright line rule that the court announced, it's going to be a little easier for, for parties to understand when there has been a waiver. And very frankly, it's going to be a lot easier for attorneys or their counsel to say, hey, don't do this or don't do that. Uh, you run the risk of waiving arbitration. I, I think it's like like any other bright line rule, it's going to have some good results and some bad results. Obviously, there's going to be some situations that might seem a bit unfair 
but given a bright line rule, especially in commercial arbitrations such as these, uh, it's it's very nice to have that because then you have a, a clear way of telling your client um, where, where, where the border is. So I, I, I like it. I, I one think it's one be final question on this, uh, and we do have a question from the audience as well. Just for context, for our, the benefit of our audience, how what had occurred in this case? If I recall, it was the defendant who was attempting to enforce the arbitration agreement, as you'd expect. Uh, usually would occur in this context. What had they done that the court concluded uh, or that may, that might constitute a waiver? Well, the, the specific facts, I don't recall off the top of my head, but they actually participated in, in litigation itself. And I think that is, that is the key. And the problem is when you start to get into what constitutes waiver, um, that, that runs the gamut. Um, and you, you just just really don't it to me, it's problematic because you don't know at any one particular point where one particular court is going to say that's enough. And other courts going to say, no, that wasn't enough to waive arbitration. Right. We have a, a question from uh, two members of the audience. I'll quickly run through both of them. And if you'd like to comment before we turn to the next case sure. uh, from Richard Faulkner uh, regarding Morgan. Uh, do the comments in the case indicating that the courts should not place their thumb on the scales of justice in favor of arbitration and the indication that arbitration provisions should be treated the same as every other clause and not more favored indicate a reexamination of all the prior arbitration jurisprudence? Uh, and, and this obviously relating to what the courts have articulated as a strong pro-arbitration public policy. Uh, do you read them that way, uh, Manny? Yeah, and and that particular quote was um, referring to the the discussion of the courts that the courts have had over several years that arbitration is a favored process of resolving disputes, uh, and there is a quote unquote public policy to, to favor arbitrations. Um, but um, the the court took a look at um, at the FAA itself and said, you know what, well, we don't see that, and we're not going to expand. Um, the right to arbitrate just because there is allegedly a public policy in favor of arbitration. Uh, we're going to look at the contract. Uh, we're going to look at the actions of the party that supposedly waived arbitration. We're going to look at the FAA and the court said, that's it. It's within those narrow lanes as opposed to, um, as opposed to anything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next case, and I'll turn to uh, Josh uh, for this case is ZF Automotive versus LuxShare. And it arises from a similarly sort of procedural question. We had a question earlier about subpoenas in, in, in arbitration under the Federal Arbitration Act. And this arises from 28 U.S.C. 1782. And what it's probably fair to say is now a couple decades worth of, of circuit splits and not circuit splits so much, but certainly divided authority among the federal courts on the issue of whether or not the statute covered international commercial arbitration. Uh, in particular, but also more broadly, international arbitration. So, Josh, I'll turn it to you to tell us a little bit about that case. Thanks, Saru. Um, Just for those of you who are not as familiar, a little background on why this case was so important. In international arbitration proceedings, the tribunal is constituted with authority over the parties to the dispute, but it does not have authority over third parties, non-parties. And so, unlike litigation in the U.S. court, an international tri arbitration tribunal cannot order a third party to produce documents or evidence. And what, what had resulted from this was an effort by many parties in international arbitration to use Section 1782, the U.S. statute, for discovery against third parties. And it had led to an entrenched circuit split where some of the circuits said, yes, it may be used in the international arbitration context and others that said no. Um, it, the decision went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the case, the, the original case that went to the Supreme Court settled, rendering the dispute moot, but it showed that the court really wanted to resolve this issue that it quickly found another case to take up. Um, the, the core question before the court was the meaning of section 1782 and in particular the phrase a foreign or international tribunal because section 1782 allowed a u.s district court that had jurisdiction over a person in that 
uh, in that jurisdiction to enable discovery, subpoenas, documents, in aid of a foreign or international tribunal. And the Supreme Court held, Justice Barrett authored a unanimous decision that said, no, an international arbitration tribunal is not a foreign or international tribunal for purposes of Section 1782. It was, you know, I think a hotly debated issue. There were amicus briefs from many interested parties. The U.S. government submitted a brief that uh, ultimately is the way that the Supreme Court came out. And the decision itself is fairly short. And uh, to, to Manny's point, it's a textualist analysis of what is it, what is a foreign or international tribunal mean. The only question that was left open after Z, ZF Automotive was, what about quasi-governmental tribunals? So certainly a purely international commercial arbitration tribunal is, is not covered by Section 1782. What about investor state arbitration under ICSID, for example? That's the Convention on the Settlement of International Disputes. And that was debated in the commentary after the decision. There have now been two decisions, one in the Eastern District of New York and one in the Southern District of New York, that seem to be following the Supreme Court's lead in a restrictive interpretation, finding that even an ICSID tribunal, and for those of you who don't know, ICSID is organized under the auspices of the World Bank. So it is, in a way, a more governmental type entity but the tribunals themselves are formed ad hoc for each case. And so the courts are, are finding so far that it's a tribunal is also not covered by section 1782. And just one practical note on this, I think in the dispute in the circuit split, what district courts were finding, a judge would have before them very burdensome discovery requests in aid of an international arbitration with parties from a different country, it was taking place in a different country with no real nexus to the United States other than there was evidence here. And I think courts are probably relieved to have the burden of those discovery disputes lifted by the Supreme Court. Um, we'll see if there's further disagreement among the circuits on whether ICSID satisfies or fits within Section 1782. But for now, it looks like the law has been clearly and decisively interpreted to, to not allow this type of discovery arbitration disputes. Uh, thank you, Josh. And, and and it is an important precedent, as I mentioned, you know, culminates about 20 years of, of this debate. Uh, it, what was remarkable is that there were two cases at the lower level that really constituted this circuit split. There were others as well. Both of them, uh, pretty rigorous textualist opinions, one written by Judge Bush in the sixth and the other written by Judge Sykes in the seventh. And they went in exactly opposite directions. <laughs> Uh, which was unusual, but the court here um, closed the door, it seems, broadly, and as you said, some of the more recent precedents. What is the result, what's the consequence for the international arbitration practice? What were some of the dynamics that were playing out with 28 U.S.C. 1782, and what did it mean for you in your practice? It, it was an important strategic uh, option for parties in international arbitration, because one of the challenges in these cases is getting discovery, finding the evidence you need, and I think without Section 1782, parties now need to be a lot more creative in, in how they're going to get this evidence, how they're going to prove their case. Obviously, they can do so. There is a discovery process within the arbitration itself. But when it comes to third parties, other strategies are, will have to be attempted now, you know, whether it's ancillary litigation or some other mechanism. But um, it, it definitely is going to require more creative approaches to disputes rather than relying on U.S. courts for this type of discovery. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we'll turn back now to Manny for two other cases the, uh, that the Supreme Court decided. Uh, the first of those is Southwest Airlines versus Saxon, in which the court interpreted uh, the Federal Arbitration Act and some of the exclusions built into the act to determine whether or not a certain group of claims asserted by uh, a kind of employee constituted or uh, were permissibly brought under uh, arbitration. And the second are, uh, was Viking River Cruises versus Moriana, uh, which reflects, I think, another 
frequent topic of, of, of Supreme Court attention here, which was California legislation uh, in designed to affect the scope of arbitration or the availability of arbitration in certain cases uh, and the court's effort, perhaps I think uh, apropos of the question we got earlier, to enforce what has been called this pro-arbitration policy that the Supreme Court has has enforced, it's probably fair to say, for the last several decades. So Manny, if you can tell us about these two cases. Absolutely. Uh, first, Southwest Airlines versus Saxon. Um, question here is whether the FAA applied at all. Uh, the reason being is that um, Section 1 of the FAA excludes, quote, contracts of employment of seamen, railroad employees, or other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. The party seeking relief here was an airline ramp, or excuse me, a group of airline ramp supervisors. These are, these are folks who load baggage um, and cargo onto planes, and the question is whether or not they are excluded from the FAA. Uh, great decision, opinion, if you want to take a look at canons of construction, because the court went through um, several, um, most uh, most notably a justum generis, to hold that ramp supervisors were similar to other classes of excluded workers, seamen and railroad employees, and that by virtue of their involvement with the interstate transportation of cargo uh, fell within the FAA's exclusion. Uh, the court in this particular case um, just it rejected the uh, a broad interpretation. Anyone who's employed by an airline um, fell within the exclusion, but also rejected the airline's narrow interpretation that the exclusion applies only to those who work on board vessels uh, transporting cargo. Again, we're talking about a... Um, a textualist approach to the FAA. So this is this is the third of the decisions that we talked about early on that really approached uh, a pure textualist um, approach to the FAA from a pure textualist uh, point of view. Very good, thank you, Manny. Uh, and I think we could probably just go ahead and turn on to the Viking River Cruises case as well. Uh, this this one is uh, a bit more complicated. Um, and actually um, sort of interesting uh, in what Justice Alito did with regard to uh, this, this particular statute. This has to do, as you said, Harut, with California. Um, and this addressed um, the, the effect of arbitration clauses um, on class litigation, not just individual plaintiffs, but class litigation. Um, this dealt with a particular California statute, the California Labor Code's Private Attorneys General Act, PAGA, as it's called, P-A-G-A. And PAGA allows um, employees uh, to, to actually bring actions as if they are part of the California Labor Workforce Development Agency and bring suit for civil penalties payable um, to the state for violations of state employment laws. Um, states typically can't require a party to submit to act class action style arbitrations. Um, there, therefore, an arbitration clause that requires arbitration of parties' individual claims but doesn't include consent to class arbitration claims is enforceable. Uh, Moriana addressed how this rule applied to PAGA suits. Uh, the court focused on two rules that California has with regard to this particular issue. First is a rule that declared unenforceable those contractual provisions requiring, requiring parties to waive their rights to bring representative PAGA claims altogether. And second, a rule that invalidates agreements by parties to litigate or arbitrate PAGA claims for an employee's own injury separately from uh, representative PAGA claims for injuries to other employees. Uh, Alita wrote this opinion 
And he said that um, in the first instance, uh, that that PAGA claim was not preempted by the FAA because as we discussed before, the FAA only it deals with enforceability of arbitration agreements and does not deal with waivers of substantive rights or remedies. Uh, Justice Alito, however, said that the second rule conflicted with the FAA and, of course, was preempted because it interfered with parties' rights to agree to arbitrate a particular type of claim, that is, individual PAGA claims, and to limit their arbitration agreement to only that type of claim. So where does that leave us? Um, that left open the question of what to do with employees representative pocket claims for injuries to other employees. Uh, here's where it's somewhat unusual. The court held, uh, took a look at California state law and held that a plaintiff who separately arbitrated their individual PAGA claim didn't have statutory standing to continue to assert representative PAGA claims in separate litigation um, that did not include the plaintiff's individual claims. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit confusing, um, but in this particular area, I, I, it's, it's probably a, a good application of the FAA. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, to turn back, before we wrap up our discussion of the 21 to 22 term of the court, I think I, I want to go back to the question that we got earlier from Richard Faulkner, which really related to whether or not, uh, based on some of the language in Morgan, the court was somehow indicating or hinting that it was pulling back from what was a very clear pro-arbitration uh, uh, public policy. Um, and notwithstanding the language in Morgan, it seems that at least in, in the last two or three cases that we talked about, particularly the uh, the Viking case and maybe even ZF Automotive, which I do recall had some language on this point, the court reaffirmed uh, this strong public policy. Um, if I can ask maybe Manny or Josh, you know, if you could respectively speak to this question of uh, going back to Richard's original question, do you think that the court was opening the door to re-examine this clear public policy of many decades? Uh, I'll jump in first. Um... I, I don't think so. Um, I think what the court was doing was um, ap applying a proper textualist approach as opposed to um, really going beyond um, where it should go. Uh, I don't see there is a re-examination of that particular um, overriding public policy. Uh, but Josh, you may, you may have some different thoughts on that. The one addition I would say is that in, in the ZF Automotive and some of the other recent jurisprudence from the court, it's not only that there, there is the policy in favor of arbitration, but I think that's often coupled with a policy, whether explicit or not, that it is a, it, it's an inherently private dispute resolution process. And I think you see that in ZF Automotive, where there's a statute that textualists could interpret either way, it's a close call about what, what it, this means in the context of international arbitration, but the practical impact of a more expansive interpretation would mean that the courts are much more involved in arbitration disputes, whereas the court has been making clear, I think, in a number of cases that you know, there, there's going, there is necessarily going to be interaction between the courts and arbitration, but there's a, a slight thumb on the scale for the, the private nature of arbitration as a matter of dispute resolution. Great, very good, thank you. Uh, and before again, we turn to the next or the current term of the court, I just wanted to remind our audience that if you have any questions, you can submit them via the Q&A function in the Zoom application. Uh, we do have one question from Eliezer Alderondo, which I am going to hold to the end of today's program and address to both of our panelists. But if anyone else has any questions, please go ahead and submit them and we'll address as many of them in real time and as, uh, as many of the balance as we can at the end of today's program. So Josh, I'll, I'll turn to you uh, because both of the cases, well, one case that the court has in its current term and another case that the court uh, has a cert petition pending on are international cases. Um, and perhaps we can begin first with the case that is currently on the court's 
uh, docket for this term, the Ashok Yegyazaryan case. Um, uh, and, and then we can turn to the second case, which is uh, has a cert petition pending, CVG Ferrominera Orinoco. Josh? Great. Thanks, Rudy. So this case, I'm going to tell you the question presented, and I think the question you should have in your mind is, what does this have to do with arbitration? So I'll come to that. The question before the Supreme Court, uh, and it took two related cases on this question, is whether a foreign plaintiff can bring a civil action under the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, which everyone calls RICO. Can a foreign, can a foreign plaintiff bring a RICO claim on the basis of an alleged injury to intangible property? That's the question the court took up. But it has in, potentially huge implications for international arbitration awards, and here's one. This case is, is a perfect example. So there, there's two, the two cases that were combined, uh, both arise out of a, a dispute in Russia between someone named um, Vitaly Smagin, who had a real estate dispute with Ashat Yejizari. And it went to arbitration for the London Court of International Arbitration. There was an award of, uh, about a decade ago. The uh, claimant, Mr. Smagin, brought that award to California to enforce it against the respondent, Mr. Yegizari. The California court um, in, it, you know, upheld the arbitration award, but did not seize assets because there weren't assets in place for Mr. Yegizari. Well, it turns out, according to Mr. Smogin, Mr. Yegizarian had been hiding and, and embezzling funds to avoid paying this arbitration award. I think with interest, it's approaching $100 million. And the reason this came under the RICO Act is that Mr. Smoggin then alleged that the respondent, along with a bank in Monaco, had been embezzling and hiding these funds so they wouldn't have to pay the award. The Ninth Circuit uh, upheld Mr. Smoggin's attempt, find, finding that the arbitration award itself was the intangible property that Mr. Yajazarian had uh, harmed through this embe alleged embezzling of funds. And so the Supreme Court, if it upholds that approach, and it's very interesting that the court took this case, I think it's a, it's a, a matter of first impression before the court. If the court finds that foreign plaintiffs can bring RICO claims, out of arbitration awards, it provides for treble damages. So here, re recall that the arbitration award was approaching $100 million. The allegation is that those funds have been embezzled or hidden in some fraudulent way, in a way that violates the RICO Act. And if Mr. Smuggin wins on that claim, he then is recovering not only the $100 million award, but potentially $300 million because of the RICO claim. So this would be a, a major step um, or, or adding a new strategy to the types of enforcement efforts that parties can bring in the United States whenever assets can be found here. So definitely a case to watch. It's gonna be very interesting to see both how the arguments unfold before the court and how the court ultimately resolves it. Yeah, I mean, and it's very interesting, again, that you have the Ninth Circuit, uh, a case from the Ninth Circuit before the court. Uh, any sense of how this might play out? I don't know if you if you have any feelings on this, and of course, purely opinion. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll actually tie this to the ZF Automotive case, where the court there is closing the door to discovery that, that would facilitate arbitration proceedings. In that way, the court often does have a more a, a narrower interpretation. But I think when it comes to enforcement of arbitration awards, courts, U.S. courts are, are about as favorable as you can find around the world for enforcement of arbitration awards. Um, and you know, I won't talk much about the other case that is up that where a cert petition has been filed. But there too, the question is one of enforcement. There was a Venezuelan state-owned entity. And um, the, the prevailing party in an arbitration sought to enforce it in New York. The Second Circuit found that um, th there did not need to be a summons in the way that you would have if you file a complaint, because enforcing an arbitration award is meant to be more straightforward. 
meant to be easier. And I, I think that could be animating the interest in the RICO angle because you know, to the extent that parties are trying to avoid their obligations by hiding funds and fraudulently not paying an arbitration award, I think courts are, are not going to look favorably on that. So I, I could I could see the policy being let's continue to make US courts a place where arbitration awards are enforced because that's that is part of the pro arbitration policy that the courts have been espousing. Uh, I mean, and, and to a degree, really, this is more a question of interpretation of, of RICO than it is of the Federal Arbitration Act. Exactly. And I'm, I'm carefully dodging that question because I'm not an expert on uh, interpreting right. RICO, but it will be interesting to see how that intersects with the arbitration implications of a RICO statutory interpretation. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you referenced the other case, that, and that is the CVG Ferro Monero case. Um, and you've described it already. I don't know if you have anything further you'd like to add about that case. Um, my my own two cents is that the court is perhaps unlikely to take up that case. It doesn't seem to be an issue with a circuit split. Um, and But it does implicate the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And those cases are, are often of interest, but often ones where the court wants a quite right and clear issue, and it's not it's not clear to me that this case would present that. But we'll see. Yeah, and, and and perhaps not surprisingly, in some of the cases that we'll discuss uh, in the next few minutes as well, arise in the context of the enforcement of arbitration awards, right? Because this is one of the key moments where enforcement or vacator, actually, of arbitration awards, it's one of the key moments that the courts intervene. Uh, or intervention of the courts is, is sought by one or another of the parties. And so this is a key example where this has occurred not only initially through the enforcement of the award, but also now in an effort to execute on the award through this through under the RICO statute. But we're we've seen this arise and it's it's a frequent area of uh, of attention, I think, for the court is fair to say, right? Absolutely. And one thing I should add is that you know we, we talk about this in terms of US law with respect to the Federal Arbitration Act, the FAA. But Section 2 of the FAA is effectively implementing the New York Convention. So this is the multilateral treaty that gives teeth to, to arbitration awards because once a party has a valid award under the New York Convention, they can go to courts almost anywhere in the world to enforce that award. And that's why US courts, often where assets can be found, particularly, for example, the Southern District of New York has a very robust jurisprudence on this issue because that's where parties can find assets and try to enforce against it. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see you know, how the New York Convention continues to factor in. Now, interesting question from Richard Faulkner, and, and it relates, I think, to the Aguizarian case. Um, he asks uh, us to consult our crystal balls and Ouija boards. Uh, and. and, and, and and really, the question is, do you predict that the Yagyazarian case may open the door or rather motivate state-owned enterprises to honestly participate in arbitrations? And this is a, a, a really hot topic, particularly among international practitioners uh, in terms of the sort of buy-in uh, for international arbitration. And I know part of your practice concentrates on treaty disputes and disputes where you're representing or adverse to states. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that question and, and the amount of buy-in, kind of the dynamics that are uh, in play, and whether you think that this case um, will uh, in any way motivate state-owned enterprises to participate at a greater uh, rate in international arbitration. That's a great question. I think I actually am not sure that um, state-owned mm -hmm. entities are really staying on the sidelines. I mean, in, in all the cases where I've gone up against the state-owned entity, they're, they're actively participating. They have counsel, and that's because ultimately these awards are enforceable. And there, there will be fights. There continue to be fights in the courts about sovereign immunity. And um, But for state-owned entities in particular, because of the commercial activity exception and because of the New York Convention and the enforcement of arbitration awards as an exception to sovereign immunity, they, these entities know that their assets in the United States um, are potentially on the hook. The most uh, famous example or the biggest case right now is the one involving Sitco, uh, 
which is a subsidiary of PDVSA, the national oil company of Venezuela. And you know, having done spent ten years or so uh, in cases against PDVSA, I can tell you that they very actively participated in, in defending their interest, in part because they knew that with assets such as Citgo in the United States, there was going to be a vulnerability down the road to potential enforcement actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and maybe a, a corollary uh, in the domestic context to that question uh, for many, uh, you know, the fault lines in the domestic context, as we've seen, I think, from many of the cases so far, often arise not so much in terms of buy-in or questions purely of enforcement, but rather on sort of the application of arbitration to certain specific areas like employment arbitration, for example, and class arbitration. And I think many, at least three of the cases that you've talked about so far arise in the co in the context, probably more than three, probably almost all of them, arise in the context of either employment disputes uh, or class disputes where there has been some legislation or other activity um, by the state legislature, for example, we mentioned California, to limit it. How, in, in your mind, have you seen this sort of play out over the last few years? It's been a frequent topic for the Supreme Court, whether you go back to you know, AT&T versus Concepcion and other cases from over a decade ago where the court intervened to uphold arbitration in the face of efforts to limit uh, accessibility or access to arbitration or availability, better stated, perhaps of arbitration uh, in the face of potentially some of the class waivers and other things that arose over the last few decades. How is this playing out, this big debate that we're having in the in, regarding internet, rather domestic arbitration? I think... Um... As you saw from the California decision, um, it seems that the court is being very circumspect in terms of how it interprets the FAA. It's not giving, it's staying true to the actual statutory text. Um, and it's not um, straying too far from the statutory directive given to it by Congress. However, uh, to the extent that the court believes that states are improperly impinging upon the FAA, it, 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 it's always also clear that the court is not shy about saying that particular state law is not enforceable. Um, the FAA has um, legislated in that particular area um, the supremacy clause takes effect, and the court, I think, is if so long as advocates can make a clear argument under the statutory text that a particular state law violates the FAA, I, I think they have a shot. But I, I don't, I don't think that the court is going to go on an expansive um, jaunt through invalidating state laws. But by the same token, the court is not going to be shy either about setting aside state laws that it thinks have actually impinged upon the rights under the FAA. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manny. Uh, a clarification, Josh, for you, uh, from Richard Faulkner, and when he referred to the engagement by state parties, and I think his question can be broadened a little bit here, but he explained that what, when he referred to sort of honestly engaging, he meant really participating fully in the process, not you know providing documents. Uh, and I think that this may even be relevant to uh, some of the 1782 issues and other procedural issues that we were talking about earlier. Uh, he in particular is referring to some of the uh, you know state-owned enterprises in countries like China and others that are not as transparent uh, perhaps as as as, so, as certain other jurisdictions. Uh, do you see in any way the the recent cases that we've talked about, perhaps the ZF Automotive case, having an impact on on that? That's that's a great point and a good clarification because that concern is well noted and, and quite true. Obviously, whether it's a whether it's the government itself or a state owned entity, not only are there valid arguments of sort of deliberative process or executive privilege that governments might try to invoke. But I think parties should be realistic about their expectations of what kind of disclosures and productions of evidence they'll receive from a government or a state entity. 
And there are doctrines in international arbitration, such as adverse inferences when certain you know, documents that are known to exist are not produced. But that's in some ways about as far as it can go. And I, I don't see that particularly changing. The one thing I'll note actually, and this is not a government or state-owned entity case, but one of the cases that was flagged is uh, two law firms, Jones Day and Oric. Well, why don't you why don't you go ahead into that case? That was the next one anyway. If you want to just mention that case, Josh. Absolutely, and it, and it relates to this issue about the production of evidence in international arbitration or domestic arbitration. It's it's a challenging thing because if you don't have the power of the courts necessarily to facilitate that. But the Jones Day versus Oric case actually shows how courts can become involved to facilitate the production of evidence in dispute. So in this case, it relates to a, a partner from Jones Day who went to Oric and the dispute arose about this. It went to arbitration in Washington, DC. I believe it's an international arbitration because the, the Paris uh, is the Paris office of Jones Day and Oric. Mm -hmm. So we have an international arbitration in Washington, DC and the tribunal, or the, it might have been a sole arbitrator, orders a subpoenas, I think the managing partner and maybe one other executive of court to testify at the hearing. And those individuals refused to do so. And so and the DC courts found that they lacked personal jurisdiction over those individuals. So then the Jones Day side uh, set up the hearing in California and California District Court did have personal jurisdiction. And the question was whether that court could enforce the arbitrator's summons to these ORIC managing partner and, and other leader. And the answer was yes, that's, that's what the Ninth Circuit held, upheld. And so I think the case is still in litigation or still in arbitration is still pending, but the Ninth Circuit upheld a California court's order that, for example, the ORIC managing partner testify at a hearing that was seated in Washington, D.C. So courts are still there. They still provide a powerful backstop. Now, if it's a state-owned entity or a government, parties are going to have to overcome sovereign immunity challenges and it will be more difficult, but it's not, it's not out of the question that the courts could facilitate that type of evidentiary production for an arbitration proceedings. Very good. Thank you for that. And, and we actually have two other circuit court cases that we wanted to mention, in addition to the one that Josh just mentioned, the Jones Day versus Oric. Uh, and Manny, I'll ask you to speak to the first. And, and Josh, if you could br briefly introduce the second. And in the last six minutes that we have, I'd like to take at least one of the questions we have left. Uh, but these are cases to watch uh, in, in, in different ways. I think both relate, though, as we mentioned earlier, to the enforcement stage of arbitration, uh, of the arbitration process. And in both cases, efforts to vacate arbitration awards under uh, the FAA and the New York Convention. So Manny, if you can tell us a little bit about the Tecnicas Reunidas case in the 11th Circuit. This is a um, decision by uh, Chief uh, Judge Pryor from the 11th Circuit. This is from uh, uh, summer of uh, last year. A very interesting case in this particular case, the, uh, the problem was that, or the issue was, that a, uh, during the process of the arbitration itself, uh, one of the counsel, um, in effect, uh, went to the other side. Uh, and then you've got this question of whether or not um, that's proper. Um, here in the United States, um, that would run into this, depending on circumstances uh, and how the receiving law firm um, dealt with the transfer of the counsel may or may not be proper. Uh, it may or may not result in a, say, a final judgment of some sort uh, being determined. Now, in in the arbitration world, that's a little bit different. Perhaps uh, that wasn't a problem uh, for the arbitration panel. They issued a $40 million award. And then, as you point out, Harut, at the uh, confirmation stage, uh, 
That's, that's where the rubber met the road, for lack of a better phrase. And the argument was that under the, uh, the Panama Convention, which is of course different than the New York Convention, um, a question whether that violated the quote unquote public policy uh, of the Panama Convention. The Panama Convention has a public policy uh, area. And here's what Judge Pryor said, uh, in, in consistent with our earlier comments that uh, these seem to be textualist decisions for the most part. Judge Pryor says, yes, there's a public policy doctrine under the pa Panama Convention, but it's not a broad uh, public policy doctrine. Uh, not like many decisions we've read in the past where a particular law or statute or whatever was invalidated because of some broad amorphous public policy doctrine that no one could quite put their finger on but seemed to be more directed towards reaching a result that the court or the panel wanted. And, and Judge Pryor says that, um, hey, listen, uh, switching sides uh, violates the public policy um, of the United States, perhaps. Uh, he doesn't issue an opinion on that. But um, there is no express provision of the Panama Convention that this violates. So again, we've got a public policy doctrine, um, but it's being narrowly construed. It's not going to be given, it's not going to be used as an excuse for um, confirming or vacating courts to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. The other thing to take away from this particular decision is the fact that there was there was a, a bit of delay by the objecting party uh, in this particular case. Uh, and Judge Pryor and the panel seized on that as well. And they said, listen, if you want to vacate something, uh, an award, uh, you better move rather quickly and you better better move rather forcefully. Yeah, because otherwise uh, there's going to be a question of waiver and whether or not you'll be entitled to vacate the award on that waiver question. So mm -hmm. very good, good, interesting decision, uh, interesting facts. Um, and But it ends up, I think, in the right place um, in that um, it doesn't give, the, the 11th Circuit was not substituting its opinion mm -hmm. for what the arbitration panel did. And it also set forth one of the rules um, to, to your point, Harut, about courts really ruling a, a good deal on confirmation or vacater of awards, it set forth one of the rules. Uh, if you're going to be seeking uh, vac vac vacature of an award, you better move on that basis rather quickly, mm -hmm. uh, other than rather than just wait around. Yeah. Uh, especially if there's a question of waiver. Yeah. Very, very briefly. Uh, thank you, Manny. Uh, I know we've got about a minute left. Uh, Josh, if you want to give us a minute or so on a case to watch also in the 11th Circuit. Sure. I'll keep this brief. I mentioned before that under the Federal Arbitration Act, there's Chapter 1, which deals with domestic awards, and Chapter 2, which deals with non-domestic or international awards. And the 11th Circuit, I think, has been the lone circuit over uh, many years now that has held that for a non-domestic award, the only grounds for vacating or challenge, challenging that award are those set forth in chapter two of the Federal Arbitration Act. In other words, the New York Convention, those are the grounds that are implemented in chapter two. The, um, every other circuit has held that you can also challenge an award under the grounds of chapter one for the domestic purpose. And now the 11th Circuit has granted a hearing en banc to decide that question, whether it has been wrong. Uh, and the Supreme Court's decision of BG Group versus Argentina suggests that it probably is. And there will be soon a, a broader array of potential grounds for challenging the award. Yeah, definitely an interesting case to watch. Uh, and I'd encourage those who have an interest. The 11th Circuit doesn't take en banc cases often, so definitely one to watch. Uh, and with that, we've reached the hour. I want to take a moment to thank both Josh and Manny for, I think, a pretty interesting and vibrant discussion today. I also want to thank the Federalist Society and the International and National Security Law Practice Group.
Uh, and with that, Jack, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank you, Harut, for moderating, as well as Manny and Josh for their valuable time and expertise today. I also want to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, as always, we do welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming webinars. And with that, thank you all for your time. We are adjourned.